Hi, thank you so much for tuning in to watch ICC's online services. My name is Ravi and I'm the founder of the International Christian Community. Please do stay tuned because right after this message, there's something very important I'd like to share with you. So in the meantime, be blessed and enjoy. This morning, I am very happy to be able to share with you a very, very special message, which is entitled, An Easter Message with a Twist. And then, I'm going to talk to you about the enemy within. This is, I've never shared this message before anywhere else. I've prepared it specially and specifically for ICC and for this Easter season. And you might be wondering, hang on Ravi, have you got the dates wrong? Because do you know Easter is next Sunday? Yes, I know Easter is next Sunday. In fact, uh, Easter should not only be celebrated once a year. Easter should be celebrated almost every single Sunday in a Christian's life. And that is because it is the epic message of Christianity. That is what Easter is all about. So with the word of prayer, I'm going to join, uh, share the message with you, and I believe that you're going to be blessed. This is a two-part message, so in a way, I will stop right in the middle today, and then we will carry on with the rest of it next Sunday, um, if that's okay with you. Shall we pray? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to understand your word and practice it. It's no point us coming to church and just listening to a sermon, have our ears tickled, go back and live as we always do, unless your word transforms our lives by the truth which sets us free. We are just practicing religion. But this morning I'm asking again, Lord, please help us to have a relationship with you and not just a dead religion. And especially in this season of Christmas, Lord, let it become even more real to us, the meaningful relationship we have with you. Speak to us, touch us, challenge us and allow the Holy Spirit to come and change us as we open our hearts to you. This morning, I pray that you would touch hearts and lives and transform us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So, let me just start off uh, with the introduction and uh, give you some thoughts on introduction. First of all, as I mentioned to you earlier on, without resurrection... There is no Christianity. The whole purpose of the Christian message is about the fact that Jesus not only died, he was buried, but he was resurrected. Once in a while, we make the Israel trip in, in our church. We have an educational trip to Israel. How many of you have already have been with us in that trip? Can I see your hands? You joined us in the trips. Fantastic. Those of you who have been there, and uh, many of you would like to, we will be doing it again in November. But for those of you who have been there, one of the highlights is when we go to this tomb. You know, there are, there's two different places where there is a uh, kind of a discussion as to what was the exact resurrection spot. But there's this one area called the Garden Tomb, which is a beautiful place. And it's got all the descriptions of what the Bible talks about. And there's one particular tomb, and there's a note written on that door because that tomb is empty. And it says he's not here because he's risen. Isn't that wonderful? That's the God we serve, Amen. a risen Savior. Yeah. Hallelujah. And that's really the epic, beautiful, you can say, conclusion of Christianity. But as we celebrate resurrection, we must go back in our mind and understand, how did it come about? What were the surrounding circumstances? What was the situations that they were there in? What does resurrection actually mean for me, for you and me today? Is it just, wow, this is wonderful, so we have a religion where Jesus rose. Or does it have any implication to our lives? Do we experience aspects of resurrection? Or do we want to? You see, that's why um, before when I was a, a Hindu, before becoming a Christian, Hindus believe in reincarnation. Have you heard of that term, reincarnation? You know, this means that when you die, you come back, and then you die, you come back, and you, you know, it's, it's basically like recycling. You know, that's reincarnation. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be recycled. But resurrection is not recycling. Resurrection is about being 
transformed. Hallelujah. It's about renewal. It's about a new life. That's resurrection, transformed, renewed into another image. And that's the aspect of what Christ is doing in us. If anyone believes in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. That's the experience we should be having on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Now, the path to resurrection is the cross. This, this time of the year, some other churches and religions around the world, sometimes they look into the aspects of the cross. Via Dolorosa, they will walk to the path where the cross was, and they will go to the symbols and the different points, uh, stations where Jesus they apparently has stopped and experienced that uh, period. But what is the cross really? What is it all about? If we want resurrection, there's no resurrection without the cross. So now let me ask you a question again. How many of you want resurrection power? Can I see your hands? Now you're getting very cashful because you know what's the next question I'm going to ask. How many of you want the cross? <laughs> now you see where I'm getting? You see, the fact is that there is no resurrection without the cross. It's very important that we grasp that. As we celebrate resurrection, we've got to be realistic. In fact, Jesus said, nobody can come to, to me unless he takes up his cross daily and follows me. Does that make sense that resurrection should also take place daily? Now, please don't get me wrong because sometimes somebody can take just, you know, this clip and this wonderful sound bite and go away and say, Ravi said in the church that we should die. Yeah. Yeah, because the cross means death. But the cross not only stops there, it's also about resurrection. It's about death, burial, resurrection. That's what Easter is all about. Now, one of his own betrayed him before Jesus got to the cross. It's very important for us to understand that he had 12 disciples. He had many followers, 12 disciples, but among the 12, one of his own, his own, if you can say, family, somebody he was close with, somebody he broke bread and served the cup, washed feet, that person betrayed him. Somebody very close. How many of you have ever experienced somebody very close to you hurting you? How many of you have ever experienced that before? I have. And the, the, the closer they are to you when they do something against you, it's very painful, isn't it? Um, the closest person to him, Jesus even said it this way to John, when John was saying, who's going to betray you? He said, the one that dips his hands in the, in, the, in the cup or in the plate will be betraying me. The one very close to him. And that was what led him to the cross. Now, the spirit of betrayal or bitterness was from before time and will end in the age to come. So we just thank God for that. Amen. So let's go back now in history. We're talking about resurrection. We're talking about the cross. We're talking about somebody so close betrayed him that led him to the cross. Now, let's just go back to history. Why did we end up as sinners living in this planet waiting for redemption? What, what, what happened? You see, it's very important to know that really before you and I were born, during the time when Adam and, or Adam and Eve was created, there was already a problem before all of that. The very first betrayal, the very first, if you will, bitterness, didn't happen on earth. It wasn't on planet earth. It actually happened in another solar system called the heavens, as we know it, the third heavens, where God was king and he ruled and it was perfect. And all the angels were obeying him and the universe was his creation and expression of his creativity and his love and his life. But among all these angels, one of God's very own angel, which was leading all the other angels into praise and worship. Today we had the mommy standing here saying, come on, let's praise God. That is form of leading you into praise and worship. That's what this wonderful angel was doing. His name was Lucifer. And along the line, somehow, we don't know where, when, how. Listen, the angels had everything they need. 
God was the richest, most powerful, most adored, honored creator in the universe. It's like, you know, there's nothing that you need, whatever you needed, God could supply. And so Lucifer was very, very, you know, well taken care of, but still somehow there was a little bitterness in him. It was not good enough. I don't want to just worship God. I want to be like God. Isn't that amazing? Just think about it. Everything was given. Everything is perfect. I mean, heaven, we're talking about heaven, right? The very first betrayal, the very first bitterness, the very first feeling of pride and arrogance started right there. And you might think, oh, okay, you know, that's bad, Lucifer. But, you know, it wasn't just one guy. Lucifer took one-third of God's angels with him. And, you know, it doesn't happen overnight for you to have a crowd like that. Nobody knows how many angels God has. Millions, billions. We can't count. It just says countless whenever it talks about masses of angels. But it took time. Over a period of time, Lucifer was able to go and talk and convince one-third of God's angels to be on his side. You know, if you are unhappy with somebody, if you want to be an opposition party, it takes a lot of hard work to get elected as president of your opposition party. The devil didn't just overnight wake up and said, now, I'm the devil. It took time, it took effort, it took energy, but one third. And that rebellion was obviously led to the fact where they somehow felt we are going to overthrow God himself and we're going to take over the first problem, the first church split, the first family split took place in heaven. For those of you who are feeling so bad sometimes, oh God, why am I so bad? Um, well, you are second in line. It started there. And according to the Bible, Jesus himself said, I saw the devil fell like um, a light down to earth. He was cast out. That was what happened. He was cast out, and here we are. Uh, we see him later on in another scenario. So it's amazing because you'll find that this started there, and the Bible tells us, God says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And he says, once again, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth because the new age that we're coming into, the new planet we're coming into, is not only going to be without sin, it will be untouchable by sin. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Wow, finally. Finally, there will be an antivirus program where there will be no sin. No more sin. <laughs> Glory be to God. Okay, we'll go further. Let's see how it all starts in this earth. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, after the, the fall of mankind, this is what God told Adam and Eve. And in particular to Adam, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. I like, I like that part. But look at what's following. And you will strike his heel. There is this battle between good and evil that started in the Garden of Eden after the fall of mankind. And ever since then, there has been this striking of the heel that this refers specifically to Jesus as the Son of God who would come, who would die for us from, through the cross, and that the devil will try his best to actually strike at his uh, heel, but he will crush his head, which he did by resurrection. And that's the beauty of it. This was prophesied even before it happened. But this split between good and evil, this struggle that you and I go through on a regular basis between the fact that there are two forces within us constantly battling for our soul is real. And the way to overcome that is through the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. How many of you always wake up in the morning and only think of good things and you only do good things all your life? You never do anything wrong. Can I see your hands? <laughs> You're always having good thoughts. You're always doing the right things. Come on. Am I the only one? <laughs> The battle between good and evil is within you. 
There was this guy who was once saved and he came to a church. Um, and uh, he was a new Christian and then the pastor knew that he had a very rough life and so the pastor met him in the church and said, it's good to have you in the church, brother, and you've been coming for the past couple of weeks. I'm so happy for you. How are you doing? He said, um, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. It's been, it's been difficult. It's been tough. The pastor says, well, what do you mean? What do you mean tough? Tell me what's going on. He says, you know, it's like, it's like there's a war going on inside of me, man. There's a war. He said, oh, really? Well, what do you mean? He said, it's like there, it's like there are two dogs that are fighting inside of me. And one is a good dog and one is a bad dog. But they're fighting all the time and, and I don't know, man, I don't know. The pastor looked, he was a wise guy and he said, hey, tell me, which dog are you feeding? Because the dog that you feed will win. Are you with me? Yeah. That struggle, that, that, that battle that you have within you, it's the cross before you have the resurrection. And that battle is not going to go away until the day we die, you're going to face this battle. And the good news is, with the help of God, thank God, you will prevail. Amen. As we will go on with the, with the message when we finish the second part next week. I'll just show you the enemy within some examples of how this has been a recurring event historically, as we have already mentioned, starting from heaven. Now, the battle started in heaven. And in Luke 10 and verse 18, Jesus said, I saw the devil being cast down from heaven. And that was the time when he was cast down and he knew that his time is running out and that is when he tempted. Now, when the devil had to tempt Adam and Eve, he had to come from outside to try and give them thoughts to plant seeds in their hearts of being against what is good and what is right. Now, God had given them a good place, set them on this planet and said, you're going to be doing well, I'm going to bless you and you're going to inherit the earth. And everything was given. But when the devil came, he started putting doubts. Are you sure God said this? Recognize that voice. Are you sure? God never said that. He never promised you this. And the doubts, and, and the little bitterness as to always... Ah, oh, I was given second best. I was never really given what I was meant to be given. God is not really good. His word is not really true. It's just, you know, a religion. I just, you know, yeah, someone is a Muslim, someone is a Hindu. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And even among Christians, we're very proud. Oh, I'm, I'm Lutheran. I, I'm Catholic. Oh, I'm a free church. You know, or is, is it because I know him as a person? Like mentioned before many times that uh, God only has children. He doesn't have grandchildren. Are you with me? You're either a son or a daughter of God. You can't say, oh, you know, my father was a, was a good Christian. My, my, my mother was a good Christian. My, my uncle and my auntie. But that's not what's going to happen. When you're faced with him, he's going to ask you, do you know me? Do you know me personally? Jesus himself said, you know what Jesus said? He said that in the, in, in, in the last days, people will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not in your name perform many signs and wonders? Did we not in your name did great miracles? And Jesus will say, away from me, you workers of iniquity, because I don't know you. Are you following? Now, how many of you know the queen of Denmark? Can I see your hands? Oh, wonderful. Okay, that, you, know, you know who the queen is, right? Uh, how many of you think the queen knows you? I've, I've uh, seen the queen in the distance. <laughs> Which one? I've seen a queen in the distance just like this, where Josiah is sitting. She was actually passing by my house not because of anything fancy in my house. It was because that whole street was celebrating a hundred years uh, anniversary. So she drove by and was passing by. The princess, I can say, I've shaken her hands because of the, some social settings. Now, how many of you know Jesus? Can I see your hands? You know Jesus? Wonderful. How many of you think Jesus knows you? There you go. You see the difference? 
It's not what I know. It's does he know me? How do I know that he knows me? Because I talk with him. I walk with him. I have a relationship with him. And I'm struggling. I'm doing sometimes good things. And, and I realize that it's because of his strength that I'm able to. And whenever I do something bad, I feel bad. Why do I feel bad? Because he's telling me, hey, come on, you can do better. I'm sure you can. You see that relationship? He's not a condemning God. You know, sometimes we feel that God is sitting on our shoulders condemning us. That's the job of the devil. He condemns. Our God convicts us. Hallelujah. The battle, the enemy within. And after that betrayal that, the, that God himself had, right from his household, right within his angels, his beloved angels, one decided to take one third away. It was a painful experience for God. And then we come down to planet Earth. In the Garden of Eden, we see it being displayed again. Before, the enemy knew that, look, I now don't want this God. I want to go against his kingdom. I don't want to be ruled and reigned by him. I want to have my own independence. And so he loves Adam and Eve. I must find a way. Somehow I must find a way to get into this unit, this family, the very first family. And how did I enter? By putting doubts in Eve. Saying, are you sure? Now, Eve has taken a very, very big, very big beating in Christianity for many years. Especially the men. Do you know why we are all sinners? It's because you, woman. You know, it's, 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 listen. The Bible says that after this conversation was going on, and Adam, who was created before Eve, should have even known better, was there in the garden right next to her, probably folding his hands and looking at the apple. It wasn't an apple, by the way. I don't know why we say apple. I don't know what the fruit was. I think it was banana. Anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> look, um, and so he decided he was right there, did nothing. The crime of Adam is even worse than the crime of Eve, being the head of the house. Are you following me? And listen, uh, they are both created equal in creation, different in function. Sometimes in some churches, you know, they think, oh, it's better to be a woman. No, 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 it's better to be a man. And then you have this call. Look, God created all of us equal as creation, which is different in function. That's all. No matter what I do when I try, I will never be able to give birth to a child. I can't. My wife can. But no matter what my wife tries all her life to do, she will not be able to produce seed. She can produce eggs, but not seed. That's it. We're just different in our function, but we're equal in creation. Amen? Amen? So in the Garden of Eden, it started. He realized that in order for me to come into this family, I must split the family. I must bring about some kind of a confusion, some kind. And so these thoughts of bitterness, these thoughts of dissatisfaction, these thoughts was planted, and the husband and wife beautiful unit was broken. And the enemy came within. Does it make any sense? We're going to get to resurrection. Just follow me because next week we're going to touch and, and finalize this. But it's so important for you to understand that sometimes as you get to the cross, before you get to the cross, there is this pain, very, very painful experience. It continued again in Cain and Abel. The Bible says that the time came for offerings. This is Adam and Eve's sons. Both of them, Cain and Abel, brought offerings to the Lord. According to the Bible, Cain's offering was, Abel's offering was received, but Cain's offering was rejected because of the principle. One brought first fruit, another one brought some fruits. And they knew, they, they had been taught, they understood the principles. And the first murder takes place in the first family in planet Earth. And how did it happen? When Cain walked up and he decided that now, I am so upset that my brother got accepted and I didn't and I'm going to take him out. From within the family came division. Right within. I mean, it was bad enough that Adam and Eve felt that, okay, Lord, you know, we blew it. But now in my own family, I'm seeing it again. The enemy came right within put the thoughts in Cain that I can do it myself and he becomes the very first murderer, murders his own brother. It's, it's sad. 
It's painful. But the enemy had to come from right within the family. Are you with me? Leading to the cross. You have the same situation in, uh, in Israel. Children of Israel were traveling and then there was this area called Massa. Massa was a place where there was basically deserty and there was absolutely no water. And during this period when they were traveling in this area, the children of Israel became very, very upset. And they knew they've seen the miracles and then they started to complain and murmur and grumble against Moses. Now, God blessed them, took them out of Egypt, performed many miracles. They have experienced all these wonderful signs from God. And yet, when they were in the, in the promised land, on the way to the promised land, as a matter of fact, do you know that it doesn't take that long to travel to the promised land? It should have taken them just a couple of days. But they ended up there for 40 years. Why? Because the children of Israel were constantly grumbling and complaining. At this particular place, they were complaining for water, and God spoke to Moses. said, Moses, take the stick that I gave you. There is a rock. Strike the rock, and they will receive water. Moses went and he struck the rock, and then they received water. And later on in the Bible, they refer to this particular place, Master and Meribah. Meribah means bitter. Because they were bitter. The children of Israel were bitter. An entire generation, because they were bitter, they were complaining, they were murmuring, they actually ended up living and, and dying in the wilderness because of their bitterness. It came from within. So now, you have, the, the, you have the situation where the enemy was looking for a way. Now they are already set free, they are delivered. Going out of uh, Egypt, going into the promised land is almost a sign, a symbol of us leaving our old life and going into resurrection life, which is a relationship with Jesus, transformation life. But in the process, you will find that there will always be discontentment. There will always be a division from within you before resurrection, which God will give you the strength to overcome. When we do the second part of the sermon, you will see what he has given us. But I just need to point out the enemy within that's always there. And in the next four minutes or so, I'm going to just end this first part of the message. And there was a similar situation with the bronze snake. Same situation, children of Israel out of Egypt, they were on their way to the promised land. Again, grumbling, complaining, murmuring. It's amazing how people Forget very quickly. How many of you have never, ever murmured and complained in your life? Can I see your hands? Wow, we have got angels. <laughs> but every time you do that, remind yourself, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this if I trust in the Lord? There's, uh, I'm not saying don't ever, you know, complain or, or murmur. Or, you, you're going to have that. It's, it's, in the, it's, it's in the sinful nature. But don't feed that dog. Does that make sense? Which dog you feed will win. Feed the spirit. Don't feed that. You can't help negative thoughts from coming into your head. The children of Israel at this point in time, they were not only complaining for water this time, they were even complaining for food. God gave them food. You know what they told Moses? He said, Moses, now you brought us again to another place. Now there's no water here. And we despise this horrendous food, which is manna from God. It's amazing how at first time they receive it and then they start despising it. God was so bad that you know what he did? He sent snakes, venomous snakes, into the camp. And they started biting people. 24,000 people died. And then suddenly they said, oh, we have sinned. Moses says, God, what do we do? He says, put up a snake, a bronze snake. And all the people need to do is just look at it and they will be healed. And Moses put up, you know, bronze is a sign of judgment. The snake being judged, the devil being judged. And when he was lifted up, it was a sign that it was a cross that's going to finally bring judgment to the enemy. Hallelujah. Amen. And so therefore, you and I must remember these small little things. And I'll probably might end with this before I talk about the last person. Then we'll go on to next week. Then you have another last but not least story. The, the, the enemies were trying to attack Israel all the time, attack, attack, and they were finding it difficult. And there was one particular uh, king who was smart. His name was Balak. Balak realized that, you know what? These people, they are blessed of God. They are blessed. Um, I can't do anything, but I'm going to find somebody as a prophet to put a curse on them. Now, some, uh, some of us who live in the West, 
you know, we, we, we might read these kind of uh, scriptures and we might just laugh it away and think, oh, this is so comical, it is so Harry Potter, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't even make any sense. But listen to me, in some parts of the world where uh, in the East and in Africa and so on, uh, even now in the West, uh, some people are actually uh, what we call operating under witchcraft, trying to bring, put curses on, on, on others if you're not safe, that is. And then some Christians are afraid. Oh, everything is going wrong in my life because somebody is cursing me. Listen, if you're a true believer and you have the blood of Jesus covered against you, there is nothing that can touch you. Amen. Nothing. I like, I like this guy, uh, Renard Bonke, one time he was out in, you know, he's a German uh, evangelist, very, very famous in those days. He was out in Africa and then this woman who was a witch doctor had a juju, uh, like a little, uh, you know, brush thingy in her hand. And she, this is a witchcraft uh, power. She looked at Renard Bonke, who is a believer in Jesus, and she said, I'm going to touch you with this and you are going to lose all your powers and you will be cursed. And because he was a believer in Jesus, he was so smart, he looked at her and he says, Lady, if you touch me with this juju, it will never work ever again. And she quickly, put, she quickly pulled the juju there and ran away. Because she realized, oh no, I'm going to lose the powers now. Because if you are, if, that's why sometimes people say, oh, you know, I'm going to put a curse on you. I'm like, go ahead, knock yourself out. I would like to see what curse works against the blood of Jesus. I, I like to see it. Because nothing has worked. Don't worry if you're... You see, that's what happened. So Balak realized that, you know, I cannot touch these people. They're protected by God. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to get Balaam. Balaam was a prophet. Balaam was a prophet of God. And he says, Balaam, come. Come and, and you curse them. I give you money. How much do you want? Name your price. At first, Balaam said, no, I'm not Balak. He sent some messengers, said, Balaam, will you come and curse Israel? And Balaam said, no, 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 I can't. You know, these are people's, uh, God's people. I can't curse them. And, but, but the king said he's going to give you a lot of money. Uh, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. It's amazing. When the money came, he was going to pray about whether should I curse or should I not curse. <laughs> and he decides later on, he says, you know what, let me just go talk to the king first. I can't say anything because God told Balaam, don't you dare curse my people. Even you open your mouth, I'm only going to put a blessing because they are my people. Balaam said, okay. And so then he sits on his donkey and then he rides with the, the camp to go to Balak. In the meantime, the donkey sees, God opens the eyes of the donkey. The donkey can see an angel standing with a sword about to take the, 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 the prophet out. And the donkey was afraid and the donkey moved away this way and that way and even sat down. Each time the donkey was going to stop, Balaam got up and took the stick and started beating the donkey. Said, you stupid donkey, you're good for nothing, you idiot animal, go. And then finally, God opened the mouth of the donkey and the donkey starts talking. The donkey says, why are you beating me? He says, because you're stupid. <laughs> and he starts talking to the donkey, not even thinking. And he said, I stopped because that angel was going to kill us. And that's why I didn't, want to, I didn't want to die. The donkey was thinking, I don't care about your life, Balaam. I want to live. <laughs> and so when the eyes was opened, and then God told him, he said, you know what? You go, fine. You want to go? You go. I'm angry with you, but you go. But be careful not to say anything unless what I put in your mouth. And every time Balaam was tempt, uh, brought up to the mountain to see the children of Israel, every time he tried to curse, blessings came. Every time he tried to curse, you know, the Bible says that if a, if a man doesn't deserve a curse, if you don't deserve a curse, even what somebody sends to you will recoil. Are you with me? So that's why it's important for you to understand that sometimes the enemy comes, Balaam, as wicked as the king he was, understood the principle, if I'm going to take out this nation, I've got to do it from within, because they are blessed. The only way I can do it is I've got to come inside. I've got to bring a curse inside. From within, I have to disrupt. That's why we have struggles till this day, from within. Are you following me? Last but not least, before we do the second part, going back to Jesus Christ himself, as we're preparing, it was... Somebody from inside. It was Judas. Are you with me? In fact, the way Judas betrayed him was with a kiss. Sometimes the path to the cross, whether it be from somebody, your family, your friends, your close loved ones, close to you, bringing pain and hurt in your life, or right from within, right from inside, the enemy is trying to take you down. It's from within. And that's why we need the cross to put that enemy down before we have the resurrection. Hallelujah. And that's why it's important to talk about the cross today before we go on to the resurrection. And this is not once a year. 
event. It's a daily struggle that we go through. That's what keeps us humble. Saying, God, is by your grace. It's by your grace that I'm your child. I'm not just a religious person, but I have a relationship with you. It's not just that I know you, Jesus, but you know me. And we have this relationship within us. Hallelujah. Amen. Hi again. I hope you were blessed by what you have just watched. Now, our vision is to help you to get in touch with God, others, and your destiny. In case you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is a time and an opportunity for you to pray a simple prayer to receive Him into your heart. All you need to do is to say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me on the cross. Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, help me to live a life as a true believer. Amen. That was a simple prayer, but if you believed in that prayer and you repeated it and received Jesus into your heart, you're born again. And we really want to keep in touch with you and ask you to continue to watch some of these teachings so that you can grow in your spiritual life. Now, if you'd like to be a part of this ministry, you can support us in three different ways. One of the ways is you can support us by praying. We'd really appreciate that. Pray for us. We covered the prayers of saints all around the world. Second, you can also do it by passing this link to somebody that you know. You know, somebody can be blessed and hopefully be connected to God just like you. Last but not least, you can also support us financially. There is a link in your screen where you can go to our homepage and figure out how you can either be a one-time or an ongoing donor to this ministry so we can spread the good news far and wide. Look, whether this is the first time I'm going to see you or you may come back to see us again, I just want to pray that God bless you and I hope that you'll have a wonderful day. Thank you and stay in touch. See you, bye.